Hello and welcome to Hackerang TV. My name is Adil Bandukwala. Always product led growth, master roadmaps, innovative new tools in the market. The product management community is a buzz right now. And we thought it'd be fun to have a conversation about it with an industry expert who's been there done that in the product realm. We're pleased to be hosting today Divakar Gupta, a seasoned product management professional who has vast exposure cutting across domains of internet, e-commerce, telecom, education, media, and even FMCG. In his current role as Director Global Program Global Product Management at Expedia, he leads post-book experience for vacation rentals for multiple brands on a global scale. A firm believer of database decisions, he has also authored a book that has been an Amazon bestseller called A Definitive Guide to A-B Testing for Online Product Managers. Divakar loves traveling and has backpacked and covered 25 out of 30 states in India. His intent is to cover all 30 states before he turns 40. Divakar, welcome to Hackerang TV. Thanks so much, Adil. Really excited to be here uh, with you and Hari and look forward to this conversation. Awesome. So, ladies and gentlemen, please remember that today, all the conversations that we are going to be having, those conversations are by specific individuals. So views expressed by Divakar are personal in nature and not necessarily of his company. But we're very, very excited to talk about all things travel, product, and tech. Because product and tech, we get excited by at the workplace. Travel is something that gets me going. I just love traveling. Uh, and incidentally, after a long time, I'm in office today and so is Hari. And I got a chance to meet Hari this week uh, a little earlier when we were doing our GTM offsite. Was super nice to meet in person. And Hari, by the way, like always, is my co-host, uh, who is the co-founder and CTO of HackerRank the technology hiring platform that is the standard for assessing developer skills for over 2,500 plus companies around the world. HackerRank is backed by GMI Equity, Kosla Ventures, Battery Ventures, and Y Combinator. And by the way, HackerRank just crossed 16 million developers on our platform a couple of weeks back. So Hari, congratulations in order for the 16 million developers. And prior to HackerRank, Hari has had technology stints with IBM and Novell in Bangalore. Hari, Thank you for making time for this. I know this is something that I really enjoy. You enjoy it too. But uh, really grateful for all the support for the last 18 months we've been doing this consistently month over month. Welcome again. Yeah, thanks, Adil. Looking, looking forward for an exciting conversation in the next one hour. Totally, totally with that. So with that, let's get started. But before we do, I know a lot of us are joining in from LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, wherever we're broadcasting live from. So you guys are going to be having the ability to interact with us live. So do go ahead and post a comment wherever you're tuning in from, and we'll have the ability to feature that on screen. So I'm seeing that quite a few people have also already started coming in. So Konark is joining us from YouTube. He says he enjoys this content and thank you. Thank you, Konark, for coming in. It is because of people like you that we kind of keep broadcasting this content. So we've got Gabriel who's tuned in from LinkedIn and he says hi. We've got Shivam who's also saying hi. We've got Nitin who's tuned in. We've got Murtuza. We've got Abhishek. Quite a few who are tuning in from LinkedIn. We typically see that a thousand plus people normally tune in. So go ahead, keep putting in your comments. And wherever you're from, type the name of the country, type the name of the city. If you have a particular question for the or, uh, for the panel, which is Hari or Devakar, feel free to put that in. And uh, once you do, we'll be able to feature them on screen and we'd love to kind of interact with you online. So with that, let's get started. I've got a barrage of questions I'd love to ask Devakar. Uh, and the first one on my mind, Devakar, has been that travel has been an incubate, incubation hub for tech innovation. And we've seen travel coming a long way from the days of physically going to a counter to make a reservation to where it is today, where stuff happens just like that online. What do you think is the next big thing in travel tech? Can we get a little bit of color? Yeah, totally. Uh, it's, it's really so interesting to see how the motivation behind travel has consistently remained the same, right? To experience, to, to get new experiences but the way we travel has transformed so much thanks to all this technology. I still remember those good old days when I was standing in the queue for IRCTC railway reservation that it would take me two hours to get a ticket done. 
And now, if it takes me more than two minutes to trip about like how slow a particular site is. So that's how long a technology has traveled this journey and really made us tra made our travel more easier than what it was before. I'm really excited to think about uh, two particular trends from how travel uh, technology could be leveraged in the future. And I see that happening to enhance the experience end to end throughout for our experience for our customers, right from shopping to stay. And two particular technologies I'm really interested in when it comes to travel are A, artificial intelligence and chatbots. I think AI and chatbots built on top of AI layers are going to really help us deliver rapid responses to users' queries, which means no more waiting for an agent to respond, give them ability to self-service a lot of their needs, and a lot of capabilities like voice search and control being built on top of the layers of these underlying AI capabilities. The second uh, technology trend that I see, again, coming into very good handy use for travel in the future would be augmented reality and virtual reality. Now, users would benefit from much more immersive travel experiences. So, for example, with the help of AR and VR, they could, you know, we, they would be able to understand more about the property even before they have booked it or physically stepped into the property, so which means that they will be able to make better decisions about what is the best fit for them. And once possibly they're inside the property, they could use AR to get more contextual information with a lot of interactive displays. So there would be immense opportunity that technology would bring. I think there are tons of technology that are going to disrupt this space, but these are the two particular ones that I very particularly excited about. Thank you for that, uh, Divakar. Thank you so much for sharing. There's just so much, so many comments coming in. I'm getting a little confused, just get moderating them. So, so far, we've got people from India. We've got people from UK. We've got people from Sri Lanka. We've got people from Nigeria. We've got people from Singapore as well. So, just want to take a moment to welcome everyone who's joining in. Welcome, uh, Mahaz Fulhak. Thank you for joining in all the way from Sri Lanka. We've got uh, Shishir who's joining in from India. We've got Wanshika. We've also got Alena who's just joined from Scotland. So Alena, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we've also got a lot of people who are just kind of commenting in. So please uh, ignore if I was a little late in terms of just getting back uh, to Divakar because there's so many of your comments coming in. And if you have any questions like this, feel free to uh, you know ping those questions in right here and we'll be able to stream them and ask Divakar those particular questions. Divagar, uh, let's jump on to another thing that's very close to your heart. You've written and published a book on A-B testing. Uh, you know, the validation technique, uh, particularly of A-B testing, has grown massively in popularity, which naturally brought ire with some uh, saying it's confusing and pollutes the code base. Uh, could you give us an overview of some common testing pitfalls you've seen and how particularly they can be dodged? This is something that I think would be very interesting to the product and engineering community to hear. Yeah, for sure. And um, yes, I think the, 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 the like multiple pitfalls that I've also discussed in the book, but uh, the one that ties most closely to the question that you ask, and I hear this very often, and this, this pitfall is what I call as the shotgun testing. So it's basically saying that if you end up testing everything, you would get something out of it, right? But the way to look at this is if you, if you were to drive an equation for results, then results is equal to the velocity, which is the number of A-B experiments that you conduct, multiplied by the average impact per experiment, and multiplied by the win rate, which is the probability of that experiment winning, right? So if, if I were to create thousands of experiments, just change colors of every single button, change the font size, change the way the page looks, I could have like potentially hundreds and thousands of experiment hypothesis created. But that also means that I'm lower on impact per AB, and I'm also significantly lower on the win rates, which means that when you start testing minute things like these, we have high velocity, but we also have lesser impact and lesser chance of come winning on, on those AB experiments. So we just end up wasting precious organizational time without yielding important and high impact outcomes. So my recommendation is actually not to go about the like just the number of experiments, but again, go back to cons consumers, go back to your users, and basis on the insights that you get from those users, create strong hypothesis of why certain thing would work or not work, and test against that hypothesis. 
it's not the other way around where you just create multiple tests and see which one would win, but actually have an in hypothesis which stands out of a very strong consumer insight and see how that works on, on your platform. I think that's that's one common pitfall uh, I would guard people against. The, the second one, which is again very interesting, is uh, not finding out the why. So people run AB experiments and get tons of data. So there are like a lot of these good tools which really help ease out the job of conducting an AB test. Uh, but then when a test fails or passes, there is a celebration or there is a disappointment. But there's not as much of a questioning as to why the test failed or why that test did, did create wonders. I think that's where the details and that's where the insights really lie. And th this is where if product managers and engineers start spending out more time and tying back those numerical data insights with the insight that they've gained from user research, focus group discussion, one-on-one -on -one interviews, that's when the real magic would happen. It's, it's like science coming up together with art to create magical results. Right. I have a follow-up question on, on that, and, and, and this is to understand how, how deep we go into the A-B testing. In general, what, what's the practice you see on there's some time you need to prepare for the A-B test or you know call it the pre-A-B test, and then the A-B test runs for a certain duration, and then you mentioned about like, you know, we need to evaluate and understand the why part of the, you know, why it failed or uh, succeeded. What's your, what do you think is your average as you've seen and you know, what's the amount of time you've seen you know, your team or in general, the industry spend on these. So that we get some, some normal, like this is the usual time it takes to run one test and, and we prepare it for some X days and then, you know, run it for Y days and then the analysis is going to take Z days. So what, what, what do you think are the, the usual averages there? Sure. So, uh, I, I think it would be better to talk in terms of percentage split between mm -hmm. these stages uh, because the mm -hmm. absolute numbers actually depend on the amount of traffic you get on your site. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so to get an A-B test, what, one mm -hmm. another pitfall that people sometimes ignore is it is important for you to run your A-B test with statistical significance. So we need mm -hmm. to have a scientific way of reading data. So unless mm -hmm. that we're reading data and making sure that it passes through the statistical mm -hmm. test like p-test and the results are statistically significant and proven mm -hmm. the a-b test is just a misnomer so it's mm -hmm. it's like saying that i'm going to test something but i'm not going to pay heed to what data says right so the the test either passes statistical significance test or it does not right it's, it's mm -hmm. black and white and that's the beauty mm -hmm. for a-b test so mm -hmm. so you cannot shortcut that and the the amount of time it would take for a test to get statistically significant, which is the minimum number of users to which we should show the new and the old experience mm -hmm. for us to get meaningful data is defined mm -hmm. by the, the number of visitors that you get on your site and how mm -hmm. much of a variation are we expecting. So for example, mm -hmm. if you want to detect uh, a 1% variation, you might actually need like hundreds and thousands of users to detect a very minute difference like one percent. But if there is something which is going to give us a 20% uptake over our control, we might actually need like one fifth or even lesser number of users because then it's like so mm -hmm. obvious for our systems to detect it, right? So depending on the traffic that your website gets and that particular feature travelers or users will be interacting with, it would define the length and the absolute duration of your AB test. And again, now depending on whether you're on a way earlier startup where consumer inciting or hypothesis creation or setting up the A-B test might be a little startup because you have a relatively less complex code, less use cases to think about, implementation which are very localized versus very large multinational organization. We have huge complex code bases with multiple use cases, multiple brands integrated to the same code bases, et cetera. The amount of time it might take for you to prepare about an A-B test would be different. So uh, in, in terms of, you know, trying to answer your question, there's no, you know, I would say prepare almost 30% time just validating mm -hmm. your hypothesis as to why you need to run that A-B test and what is that insight that you're trying to test. As soon as you're clear that this is the insight and you have a strong reason to believe that why this A-B test would perform and you're able to justify that with the background data or user insights, that's when mm -hmm. you should actually go into the next phase, which is technical implementation and 
you know, speaking with your engineering and making sure that your A-B test runs the way you're designing it to. And then it would take as many days as it would, depending on the traffic that you get for the test to run and get statistically significant. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it might take like a week or so to uh, to get a first cut of data and results. Now, depending on how mm -hmm. complex those results were, and do you need to follow up research studies? Do you still need to go back to users and research labs and understand why it happened that way? It would, again, might take like a couple of weeks before you can actually make a lot of sense. Now, this is when you're really testing something new and complex, but this cycle could be much shorter if you're testing something mm -hmm. which is very, very primitive. For example, just mm -hmm. testing the size of a CTA to see whether a uh, a certain seat, particular seat is sort of brought in an uplift in a certain metric or not. So this could be a relatively very simple test. This hypothesis is very simple. This could be like possibly the preparation phase could be like just a couple of days and then you launch this test. If you are, are, are a site with a reasonable traffic, you might want to run this test, uh, end up running this test for two weeks and then just three or four days for data analysis. So then you can actually squeeze the whole cycle and then have results within two to four weeks. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that's that's very insightful. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I do want to uh, switch tracks and ask about the, the product experience and especially your experience with the Global Stay Experience team. You led the Global Stay Experience team for vacation, which, which enhances travelers post booking experience. Right. And, and I want to know, like, how do you establish the strategic value for this ver vertical given this is this is outside your typical conversion funnel is this your your version of the skunk works or the moonshot project you took in and how did you execute that what are the challenges you face could you could you talk a little bit about that sure totally great question and i got this quite a lot of often when we started with this vertical within expedia mm -hmm. so uh for product managers who work on products within the the search and discovery and shopping phase most of the times the north star metric is conversion which is relatively easier to measure and also quite um, quick to measure so unless you're in products which take like multiple days of uh, planning and shopping cycles something like an e-commerce site on on an amazon or a shop clues or a, a flip card you would typically go put your products in a card or in a wish list and then check out uh, or maybe just keep them parked for a couple of days and then come back again and check out so the cycles, the shopping cycles are small, and then you can immediately measure the impact on conversion. Whereas something like a post-book experience for travel is much more complicated. So that's where I think what we need to do is, and what we've done is, we need to look at metrics which are beyond conversion. So how do we then define the success of a certain feature that we've launched for a traveler? So from a long-term metric or a long-term indicator, the two metrics that I like to track one is the repeat rate, and one is the net promoter score, the NPS score. So the NPS tells us how happy the travelers or uh, unfortunately if not, then how disappointed were they with a certain experience. And repeat rate tells us how was the probability for them to come and book for us again. Now, with, with both of these long-term indicators, the good thing is that they're really directly tied and causal with future business. So the complexity about both of them are both of them are fairly fairly broad metrics. A repeat rate or an NPS could actually be impacted by multiple multiple different things, things which are sometimes outside of your control. For example, you book a flight, uh, but then the ex experience within the airline was so overwhelmingly good or so overwhelmingly bad for some reasons that the halo effect also comes to the organization from which you booked the flight, right? So sometimes it becomes hard to separate out or attribute specifically what went good, bad. And that's where there is a need for metrics which are very specific to a project that you're trying to drive. So metrics which are, act as a good short-term indicators. So for example, if you're building a chat bot to help travelers cancel their reservations without speaking with an agent, then what is the self-service rate, which is the percentage of travelers which were able to actually successfully cancel their reservations using the chat bot is a good short-term metric. All right. And, and, and in this way, uh, have you, like, when you sp sp uh, spoke about the metrics and picking the right metrics, and especially it's, it's easier to pick those big, 
the final metric, the North Star metric. How do you go about splitting down that into those the right metrics which you spoke about? Like, uh, how does the the process of take this big goal and then we are going to go with this one metric, which is the say either automated ticket cancellation or automated ticket booking? Uh, how how deep should someone go into uh, uh, versus, because it can be you know too narrow as well? How do you find that nice, nice balance between it's it's not very very specific, but it's also not too broad. Like, how do you find that right balance in this metrics which you spoke about? Yeah, again, again, a great question, and this is where uh, again a common pitfall for product managers to fall into. The way I, I try to look at this is uh, not you know define both a primary matrix and a bunch mm -hmm. of secondary metrics. So the mm -hmm. primary metric is the criteria for your test or for your uh, intervention to pass or fail and you for you, you to define success. And the secondary mm -hmm. metrics are more like guardrails, which help you understand what were the follow followover impact of your intervention mm -hmm. on other areas, uh, which are critical for your business and critical for a travel experience. So a combination of both is what really helps for us to safeguard things and yet have a very specific focus on something that we could try to call as a primary metric. All right, all right. Yes, that that makes sense. That is that having those two would, would act as the right counterbalance there. The next question I wanted to ask is about you know how much we can learn from customers and customer problems. Especially customer problems are goal mine of opportunities from a perspective of a product manager. And, and there is a lot of feedback we get from so many channels these days. What are some of the key ones that you have observed in the current travel and tourism landscape that the new age technology can address, that the problems which we can solve using pure technology solutions? Yeah, great. Uh, so we, we do, uh, uh, you know, we custom, as you said, like customer feedback is like, like for for I say if I have to call like this one thing that I love most and spending time is uh, about understanding and reading customers' feedback and really going deep into what their needs are. So if I were to uh, decode some of the some of the new um, or the current travel uh, landscape trends, I need three things that come to my mind. One is enhanced need for cleanliness. So cleanliness is always important. But now it 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 is just treated as a high team, you know, as long as you have a certain degree of cleanliness, it's great. I will crash in into that room. But now there is a different level of expectations from travelers about the level of cleanliness and the level of transparency travelers would expect about being communicated how this prop how how certain cleanliness practices are followed by that particular property or airline or car rental. The second is again a new trend. Uh, would be on contactless experience. Now that contactless experience could start from booking process to payments to checkout and also checking in into the property. So I think there's tons of work which uh, property owners are investing uh, in contactless experiences and I think this will only go uh, coming forward. The third uh, one I would like to talk about is personalized recommendations in the midst of overload of choices. So as internet has done so much good, you also the, the also policy of that is we're now burned with the overload of choices. You go and you Google like, okay, I want a you know, hotel in Delhi, and I don't know like how many thousands of results that you published immediately, or you go on any OTA site or online travel agent site, and you, you put in a search query for hotels in Delhi, you just bombarded with the number of hotels. And then it sort of becomes a strenuous exercise for some to just figure out what's the best hotel or what's the best place to stay or best airline to travel with, et cetera, and so on and so forth. I think leveraging on data loops and personalized recommendations with a very deeper understanding of the customer segments a particular organization is trying to cater to, and then presenting those options which are best fitted for a particular traveler this is going to be like another very big milestone and big, big technology unlock. All right, all right. Yes, I, I saw a comment where someone wanted to first view the place in a, in a virtual way and then go there as well. Like, so it's it's, it's completely end to end. They want to virtually see the place as well uh, uh, before they go. So the, I totally understand why someone now 
the whole contactless uh, check-in, check-out payment, that's, that's, that's the way we are living our life. So I, I understand why that's going to be the key uh, in the future as well. Um, sticking to the customer part, there is, there is right now the customer acquisition cost is, is always high. And many, many companies have moved to you know, product-led growth or you know, growth hacking or different ways people call it where product is the main driver for growth. Like product is built with growth inbuilt in it, growth levers and multiple places there. And word of mouth does most of the work as well there based on what the product does. So what are some of your you know, product growth strategies or growth hacking strategies you have seen working well while working with various organization? How do someone go about getting started with this whole growth hacking when, when they're just getting started, let's say, when there is nothing at all, what's the, what's the initial investments someone should do to get the growth hacking culture into the, into the organization? Divakar, are you there? I think, uh, the worker screen has probably gotten frozen. Uh, this can happen uh, because uh, we're all living in the virtual world. And sometimes, you know, you have a power fluctuation. Sometimes uh, you just lose the internet. You never know. So maybe just give the worker uh, some time to try and figure out his connection while he gets back. Maybe uh, I can have a quick chat with Hari uh, and ask him a few <laughs> questions that I've been uh, itching to ask uh, because Hari's been building... Uh, a tech company for the last uh, 10 to 11 years. Uh, and I think that could be fun. So the, the, one, the one thing that I saw, Hari, which I think like would be a perfect question for you, was uh, a comment that came in from a particular user. But uh, just, hey, Devakar, notice that you're back. Perhaps uh, I was just telling people that because we're all working remote, sometimes things can happen that it could be a power fluctuation, your broadband goes off. You never know, right? So uh, please excuse us if that happens. And I think people are totally cool. It happened on one of our earlier live streams as well. But now that you're back, uh, I know we can go back to Hari's question that he asked you. But uh, there was another question that came in from uh, the, the audience that I think uh, we can take. And I'd love to get both your perspective as well as Hari's perspective. Uh, perhaps we can go with your perspective first and then get Hari's feedback as well. Shashwat, who's tuned in from YouTube, is asking, what feedback do you prioritize and what kind of feedback gets your immediate attention? Because a lot of people give feedback, but what matters to leaders like you who are in the C-suite, right? Um, how do you, how, how, what kind of feedback makes you jump out of your seat and say, hey, we've got to fix and what will you prioritize? So we'd love to hear from you, uh, Devakar, and then we can go to Hari maybe. Yeah, great question. And thank you for your question, Shashwat. Um, so a, uh, let me just take a step back on how do I recommend uh, captioning user feedback? Now, the, we interact with our customers multiple ways. And uh, you know, today, travelers and customers can reach us, irrespective of what industry one of us in. They can reach out to you from social media. They can reach out to through your call centers. They can reach out to you through uh, or leave a feedback on uh, Google app or iOS app store reviews. They can leave a feedback on any third party review stores as well. So the first job is to collate all of these feedback. And I'm sure also feedback from le left within your own feedback forms on your own sites and apps. So collate all of this feedback into a single repository. And you know, again, leave this technology uh, to to cull through a lot of this feedback and make sense out of it. So more often than not, we would see certain buckets emerging from these types of feedback. The first step is how do you use natural language processing to bucket all of these feedback into a couple of large teams. And then for each team, start tracking volume of that particular feedback and also start tracking sentiment of that feedback. So with that, we would be able to come up with a two by two matrix of saying high volume and very high negative sentiment. So this is the topmost pain point, which is actually hurting most of your customers. And then you have a feedback sentiment, which is very high on sentiment, but low on volume, which means there's something wrong, but it doesn't reach most of your customers. It's like an edge case, which like certain segment of travelers or your customers face about that issue, but not everyone. And then 
on the lower two quadrants, you would have feedback with the low sentiment, high in volume, which is like this, there's something which is strong and it's affecting a large number of travelers, but it's not something that they cannot live with, right? And then finally, you have like the less, the, the fourth quadrant, which is less feedback volume and less negative sentiment. And likewise, you could also have an axis on the positive sentiment side. Now, assuming that you you, know, you more you, you would really want to prioritize something on on the negative side, so the quadrant with the most negative sentiment and the most feedback is the quadrant that you I would typically like jump on and really go deep dive into those large buckets and say, okay, within those large buckets, what are the top two or three things that are hurting our customers, and really go after them and then. Go in, 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 I would actually myself do read the backends of those feedback to get a quick sense of what uh, our customers really face and what are they going through and then how might we solve them. So that's the approach I would recommend uh, going around prioritizing feedback. That's an excellent answer, Devakar, because you know what? You not only answered one, you actually answered two questions there. Because uh, you answered Shashwat's question, and Shashwat queued in from YouTube and asked that question. But there was also another question from Richard Bean, who had uh, pinged a few minutes back on LinkedIn. And he was saying, you mentioned AI and chatbots are an emerging trend, but is sentiment analysis and application being applied? And I'm glad you spoke about that, right? Because that also kind of gave in a layer and answered a certain part of Richard's question. So Richard, hope you're listening and hope you found that uh, answer useful. Uh, with that, I'm going I'm to try and ask Hari the same question. Hari, what kind of feedback gets your attention and what kind of feedback do you really prioritize? I think we've gone through multiple stages. So the early stages, whenever any candidate, and for us, it's, it's a candidate experience, which is very critical. And at the end of them giving an hours assessment, they have enough feedback to talk about the product. Uh, and so it, the V1, uh, if, I, if it was one, any time when they would finish an assessment, we would get a mail and there used to be a common mail group we all used to be which is like you know feedback at say hacker rank and the minute they send them feedback we would get it and we'll all jump onto it and read it and that scales to some point and post that we started doing once a day collect all the feedbacks and then you know sort it based on some level of this the negative feedback or group it by some this is all the, the customer segment in different ways uh, but you know, every day that used to be the the uh, uh, call it the bedtime task. Like before sleeping, read the entire feedback, get a sense of what the day was, and and you get some level of get the clear judgment on this. These are the areas you're you're seeing more feedbacks. You're seeing these in a repeated ways. This is something I've read the whole week. Like let's go ahead, jump onto it and fix it. And then the V3 is when we invested in some of the things which Divakar mentioned, like identifying areas identifying the sentiment of the feedback so that you could focus more on the areas um, you want to focus on. There are, there are two ways. There's certainly, and there's always an urge to go ahead and fix the negative feedback, but there is also double down on the positive feedback. Like we are really good at these. Let's see if we can go even better in these. Like, so, so there is the, so it's not just about reading the negative feedback and fixing the problems. But wherever we are good at, we need to be the best at, right? So we need to do those as well and see how do we increase the positive feedback suaveness or whatever we used to measure it that way. So that's that's something we have done across the stages. Right now, it is it is different channels. Most of the things Divakar mentioned, it's streamlined that way. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Just Thank to, you for sharing that. Just to add, there was one... Uh, one great thing that we did in one of my previous organizations, and what we did was we installed a parallel customer care phone line uh, very close to our water cooler. So it was a listen-only line, which meant that anytime I would be standing near close to the water cooler, I want to take a break, I could actually just lift up the phone and listen to five minutes or four minutes of worth of conversation between a live conversation between our customer and our agent. And that was so refreshing and sometimes frustrating when you start listening to that conversation and say, okay, am I the product manager for this? Right? How 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 are they really miss this? And this is this customer is getting so frustrated for something so small. And when you hear it live from a customer, it was uh, it it is it is uh, it was very validating. It is in terms of you you're on the right track or you're not on the right track. 
and then you're able to really bring customer empathy right into your organization. So if you can invest in, in case your privacy and security norms do allow there are certain product types for which it might not be possible always, but uh, in case uh, it is, uh, it's something that can be done, I would strongly say this, just put a phone line near your water cooler and let all your employees listen to calls that uh, your agents receive. That's an amazing that I think hack. is fantastic, fantastic insight and hack, right? Exactly what are you saying? Right. Uh, so with that, yeah, we'll go to. Like... Sorry, go on, Hari. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, Divaka, I'm not sure how much of the question you heard earlier, so let me repeat the question. And and I was talking about the product-led growth and, and growth hacking, especially these days. The customer acquisition costs are growing high. Companies are leveraging the product-led growth, the growth hacking, where product is positioned as the main driver for growth. Like, like product is the center for growth. And, you know, the word of mouth that's about the product does most of the work. Uh, what are some of your, your product-led growth strategies or, uh, you know, growth hacks you have seen which work well in various organizations? And how do you set up this culture of product-led growth in an organization when they're getting started? Like, what are the... What are the basic pillars you need to have to make sure the entire organization focuses on uh, the product-led growth aspect? Sure. Um, great question. So I would actually deconstruct growth into two parts. And one is acquisition and the other one is retention. I think both are equally important. Now, as far as acquisition is concerned, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of loops and I can I can see there are four different loops can, that can really give good results. The first one is a data loop, which is the more number of users that have and you, the data for which you have, how do you leverage that data or that feedback point for with every user interaction improves the experience for the next customer or the experience for the same customer for the next interaction. So how do you capture that data and how do you really leverage that data to improve a customer interaction? So that's first loop. The second loop is a social loop where how does the product get better by the behavior or users creating that content? So as you have more and more social engagement, you have more and more content, more and more content means more people coming and engaging with it, and more people coming and engaging means more people contributing to it. So that's the second growth loop uh, in, in, in terms of uh, product growth. growth. And the third one is a viral loop where when a user interacts with a piece of content to produce personalized results, and then goes on to share those personalized results by posting on our other social media platforms. And the fourth one is a network effects where the, the two sides of a marketplace or the, the, the two sides of a certain ecosystem drive each other up and pull each other up. So I think just focusing on some of these four growth loops that I talked about can give really exponential results and create a good footer which is very difficult for your competition to get through because they have all vicious positive cycles to get into. And once you get into those positive vicious cycles, you see exponential and hockey stick sort of growth curves. The second one, which I would say some, some organizations tend to under focus one is on retention. But to me, retention is one of the largest indicators of the success of the product and get these focused on. So retention is really something that can give you the cumulative growth effect that all of us strive for and also help reduce the cost of acquisition by really deepening those relationships with your customers. So again, I think that's how I would uh, break down product like growth into uh, some of these network effects and growth loops and a focus on retention. Awesome, thank you for sharing that, uh, Divakar. We've got a fun little segment here that uh, we'd like to get into where we normally invite users to, uh, listeners to kind of put in their opinion. So this time, because we're talking about travel tech and product, we've got a quick video that we'd like to play, which is sort of a quiz uh, where we'll ask you a question and we'll give you three answers. We'd love to get all of your inputs in terms of what you think uh, excites you the most. So here we go. It's called, what's your take? We'll play this particular video and then we'd love to get your answers in the comments and we'll get answers from Hari and Divakar as well. So let's go with what you think.
So there you go. The question uh, was, uh, what travel tech trends are you really fascinated by? And what do you think will rule 2022? So if you have a particular preference or one that was not included in those three either, please go ahead and put your responses as comments wherever you're tuning in from and we'd love to feature them on screen but before you know we uh so there's someone who's saying number three uh there's someone who's saying a so we've got a bunch of trends there we've got augmented reality we've got virtual reality we've got robots uh we've got a lot of those so i'll keep featuring those answers on screen but uh hurry let's start with you uh because you also kind of enjoy traveling uh and you haven't been to a place in a while but uh, per the little secretive talk that you and I had the other day when we met in person you were on the verge of traveling uh, you know making a travel plan so what trend of travel tech are you really excited by I would love to get your inputs even if it's not in the three that we mentioned could be something totally different yeah that that the tech side of me wants all three it looks like living in the future and and all the sci-fi sci movies I have seen they were all somehow connected with that. But I think I'm, I'm probably going to go with um, uh, the robots. Uh, and, and this is mostly because of my personal choice. Uh, the VR and AR, I, I think at some level, you, you don't need to be there. Uh, uh, um, I, I remember one of my uh, geeky friends saying, why do you have to go to a beach? You could always search for a pic and see it, right? Like, and, and I... I couldn't, I had to explain to the person saying you need to be there. So uh, I, I'm not sure how much VR is going to come close to the whole experience of, you know, what a nature or beach or mountain or whatever you want to travel. Robots sounds cool for me. So I, I'm probably going to go with that. So it's going to be robots for Hari, but quite a few people, particularly who tuned in, are talking about VR. And yeah, yeah. Uh, let me ask you this question, Divakar. Like you've traveled to 25 states already in India out of 30, and there are just five left. I'm curious to know which are those five left. Also, then are you also a fan of VR? Because I am not. I'd rather go to the place because I just like traveling so much. What kind of a guy are you? We'd love to get some insights from you. Yeah, sure. So I, I, I love backpacking uh, and I've been uh, fortunate to travel extensively in India and abroad. So the five states which are pending are um, Mizoram, Tripura, Orissa, and Arunachal, and Charkhand. So those are the five states that are still off uh, my list. And I'm happy to partner when go backpacking with anybody on the call right now. And maybe other than Hari, you can join me. Uh, I, I'm just planning like something maybe for the Hornbill Festival later this year if that happens. And coming to your question, I think I found uh, AR to be exciting um, because AR is a good mix of technology and being in that place. So uh, I know it's not as pervasive in India right now, but just being you know connected with your devices and being in that place and yet being able to use some augmented reality to get, okay, what's the next show that's happening? Where do I go next? What, what is the next hottest thing happening in that town where I am? And following all of that is a good adrenaline rush to already enjoying in that moment. 100%. So there you heard it from Divakar. Not a lot of times you'll get an invitation from a C-suite leader who'll say, hey, I'm going to the Hornbill Festival. If you want to join me, ping me. There you are. So you can ping Divakar. You know where to find him. He's on LinkedIn and you can find him on other social channels too. But uh, imagine if I were an engineer or a budding upcoming product manager, I would just grab this opportunity by the horns and go and ping Divakar saying that, hey, I'd love to travel. For all you know, I might get hired by Divakar even. So if you're looking for that growth hack or career hack, I'd say jump on this opportunity. Um, I'd love to, you know, uh, try and see if our schedules align. Divakar would definitely try and make use of that invite uh, and go together because I, I need to learn a lot about product management and I'll use, make use of any and every opportunity. Sure. The, the only caveat is the, the trips would be fun only and no, no business talk. As long as that rule is maintained, I'm all game. <laughs> of course, of course. I mean, we're smart enough to figure out our uh, career hacks or, uh, you know, growth hacks. But we'll keep fun aside and then we'll bring back work as and when required. So... Uh, yeah, like for example, Aditya says, he just put in a comment saying that Devakar saved the best states for the last. 
well, you never know what's in store unless you actually go there, right? So, Aditya, we'll see how that kind of goes. Uh, but, Hari, I know that you had another question that you've been wanting to ask Divakar. So, back to you. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Adam. Well, my last question for Divakar. I wanted to understand, uh, especially, you know, we're seeing a huge demand for tech talent in the, the market recently. And, and as the startup ecosystem matures even further, uh, probably retaining tech talent is going to be a huge challenge, especially in product and engineering segment. So what are some of the levers beyond compensation do you think which can help this in, you know, in attracting and, and retaining? Like, like you mentioned, growth is both acquisition and retention, and that applies to your, your talent as well, attracting new new engineers, product managers, and retaining the ones. What are, what are the, some of the ways you think which can companies can do beyond compensation as being the only lever at this point? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, I think this is, this is a, a great time uh, to be in the tech space uh, as an employee. And uh, also a great time for employers because this is the exact sort of time which is the litmus test for great employees versus good employers. So, so, of course, compensation being one thing, but how do we look at engaging people beyond compensation is the real question, right? Now, there are three things which um, I would go to. One is defining very clear organizational values that drive purpose and meaning to one's work. The reason I'm particularly with Expedia is because of my own personal passion for travel and how I think I'm able to help millions of travelers globally have better travel experiences. There's nothing more satisfying to me as an individual when I release and my team releases a feature which would improve a traveler's experience and the way they are spending those very well curated and saved four or five or 10 days of their life to go in and spend their well saved money on a great experience. So I think having and defined that organizational value and culture is a great first step. The second one would be enabling teams to go after the biggest opportunities and making an impact. Is sometimes we define organizational hierarchies and structures so rigidly that it sort of curtails people from going after what's the next best opportunity and limiting them in a certain remit or space. But as soon as we take off some of these glass walls away and give an opportunity to people the maximum impact that they can in the areas that they would like to contribute, there's that autonomy and that sense of with responsibility comes accountability. I think that's a great second lever to pull. And finally, I think it cannot be you know, overstated in providing a great organization culture where people feel respected and recognized uh, for the work that they do. So uh, having a sense of satisfaction, having a mutual respect and giving a safe environment which is safe to experiment and giving an environment where people can make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. I think this is sort of an environment which is a great unblocker and enabler for product tech folks in today's world. God, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah. yeah. Adil, back to you. I think you have a few questions as well. Yeah, a question that I've been meaning to ask you, Divakar, very, very from a product manager point of view, right? Since we have a number of budding and aspiring PMs, like I can see who joined us today, any advice from you on how they can sharpen their product sense and really develop product thinking. How can you do that in, in the most practical way possible? Awesome question. So, and very nicely phrased, uh, because product management, like, of course, it's a skill, it can be gained. It's, it's a sense that you develop. It, it's, a, it's like a, you know, a, it's like a wine tasting skill or a tea tasting skill that you can acquire, right? And there are very clear ways of acquiring this. So this, there's no rocket science, a very simple process. You just have to be mindful and you just have to do certain things on a very on a day-to-day -day basis. Number one, reverse engineer product that you use in your day-to-day -day life. So you keep question, keep keep asking questions frequently. If you're using Facebook, you're using Instagram, you see a new feature launch, stories, ask this question to yourself. For whom would this feature would have been built? What would be the characteristic of this target audience who is going to use this particular feature? What need is this product solving? What could be the other ways of solving the same problem? 
why would this product manager of who launched this particular feature would have chosen this particular route and not others? And how would I do it differently if I were to launch this feature? Right. So keep asking this question. And then I'm sure like in our typical day, we encounter so many different ads. We're all online all the time. So we're encountering different apps with different websites, different products. So just keep asking and keep reverse engineering all of those products with these couple of questions that I just mentioned. And then don the hat of a founder and keep questioning what would you do differently if you actually owned the product and this product was like your bread and butter and your living dependent on was dependent on this product. So how would you do it differently? I'm sure Hari can talk about it much more being a founder himself, but just trying stepping into the shoes of a founder and thinking, you know, how would you do things differently if your livelihood dependent on dependent on the success of this product? So that would actually make you make very different decisions about your product and the features that you launch versus when you just think about being yourself a product manager for a very specific capability or a limited set of features in the product. And lastly, observe other similar products right, in the category and see how each one of them is solving very similar needs and yet differentiating itself from others. So you would see a lot of common patterns and yet at the same time, you would see patterns which help certain products stand out versus others. So what are those features or what are those experiences that led those products to stand out and go on that winning trail? So I think it's just about like keep being more mindful. It's like more like a daily meditation, uh, a mindful meditation where you consistently in the moment observing the product that you are with and trying to re-engineer and reverse engineer those products and trying to hone your product thinking skills. That is awesome. That is awesome. Thanks a lot for sharing that, Devakar. You know, there's a question coming in the comments, which is very interesting, and I must ask you. And after you, I'd love to get Hari's input as well, and then I'll I'll share mine. Uh, you know, with the uh, Nishant Sony is actually asking, with the advent of space tourism, does the future possibility of companies facilitating space travel excite you or scare you, Devakar? What's your take? Any, any opportunity always excites me. I think uh, as product managers, um, a, a, anything where we, we, we could, where there is a need, where there is a traveler or there is a user need, and we think that we can fulfill that need in a certain way, is an opportunity. And when, where there is an opportunity, there is a possibility of monetization. You, you bet. You bet. Couldn't agree more. But Hari, as an individual, does space travel excite you or does it really scare you? I mean, individual, yes, it is a little, it is, it is a little scary of the unknown and, and given the risk, it, it sort of follows the same airline industry, right? Like the, uh, the, the first flight I took, I was flicking at all the corner cases and the, you know, edge cases, not the safe landing. And, and with the first space tourism, I think I'm going to think about all the else cases or the exceptions in the code rather than the actual happy case. So that's going to be the individual side is a little scary, but for sure, uh, uh, you know, I'm hoping it, it follows the same airline industry where only the very few people who are super wealthy could afford it. And then it becomes the mainstream market and then opens a lot of opportunities. So would I be the first few folks to travel? No, but would after it's it's certified safe for I travel, maybe yes. That's 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 the individual uh, 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 no opinion there. Hari spoken like a true engineer. Edge cases. So what I'm reading between the lines here is, you won't push code into production first time ever. You would rather have somebody else push it, see it go live. And then the next time you will push it just to be safer. The same applies for safe space travel. Yeah, as well. I, I, yes, I'll, I'll use the work as well. I do an A-B test with a small percentage of users, <laughs> see the feedback. And then if it's all fine, then launch it for everyone. Uh, that's that's the way. So that's another reason for all of us to Once. go back and read Divakar's book uh, and figure out multiple ways of how to make this actually happen. Yeah. What's your take, Adil? My take is I'm excited as hell, but I'm also that 2% scared because I'm always upbeat about, you know, trying different things. But the fact that nobody's gone into space is, is like, I mean, sure, people have gone into space, but...
going into space actually landing on another planet spending some time there and then getting back and getting back safely that's that's like uh, a whole different level so a part of me wants to do it but a part of me is also like i don't know if you're smoking adil like be careful so <laughs> let's see i'm i'm on the fence on this one Right. So with that, um, you know, we're just about at the clock. Uh, it's time to call this a wrap. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This has been a lot of fun, Devakar. Thank you for being an amazing guest. We learned a lot from you, uh, and I'm going to go back and process my thoughts and try and see if I can come up with a post where I can summarize my learnings. But Hari, you've been superb as always. Uh, thank you both, Hari and Devakar, for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Love this. Thanks, Hari. With that, here's Hari and me from Hackerang along with Divakar signing off and wishing everyone a very happy Diwali a week in advance. With that, don't get too naughty. Don't go bursting. All those crackers out there, stay, stay safe from noise pollution. Do celebrate. Go ahead and have those laddus. Go ahead and have those mitais. It's okay to binge in on a few calories every now and then. Uh, but stay safe. Take care of yourselves. And we'll see you back in November. Have a good time, everyone.